Catherine, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Justin. Yeah, I'm excited to dive into this conversation. Obviously, we met at the Unstoppable Success Summit with Amberly Lago. We both spoke there. Uh, and I was just, I loved your message. I love what you brought to the table. I loved your authenticity, your vulnerability. And obviously, as a man, at that point, three weeks out from my wedding, and now when this comes out, will be three weeks post my wedding. Um, but you know, how you speak about relationships, I think is so important and not many people are doing it. And we're going to dive into all that stuff, but why don't we take a second and you tell us who is Catherine today? And then we'll break oh, down how you got there. That's a good question. I'm still trying to figure that out, Justin. <laughs> so I, uh, today I'm an author of the book relationship grit and mother of two adult children now 24 and 22. And I am in what I like to call my second act. So, you know, early on in my relationship with John and we can get into relationships, um, he and I were both, my husband's John Gordon. So he's an author and, and speaker as well. And um, so, you know, early on in our relationship, we were both kind of movers and shakers in, El in uh, Atlanta. And it really got to a point where I had to make a decision. And when I tell people this, I'm not, saying, oh, give up your dreams or any anything like that. But it was a decision that I had to make. And it was like, okay, am I going to continue to be head to head with him trying to, you know, one up each other of, of where we're going? Or am I going to get behind him and support what he's doing? Or is he going to get behind me and support what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And we kind of had a meeting in the minds. And I said, you know what, for now, I'm going to get behind you. And, and we're going to, we're going to make a go with this and then we'll go from there. Um, and so obviously it was 25. I didn't know it was going to take that long, which was fine. And I'm actually, I in betting on him, it was a good bet. Thank God, <laughs> you know, for him, uh, 27 books and 14 bestsellers and all the things he's doing, but now it's my time. And so, uh, now I am a podcaster of the podcast, Catherine for real, which you're going to come on and the author of, like I said, relationship grit and, uh, two more books in the works, one on sex. So, mm. yeah. yeah, so that's who I am. Yeah. It's so it's, it's fascinating. And, and here's why I love hearing that part of your story. So rewind and, and I'm sure we'll probably go deep when I'm on your show on this whole thing. But um, I sucked at relationships. Like when it came to love relationships, I was a self-sabotager. Like I, in my mind, I was like, they're going to leave me anyway. So how do I get out of this without, without being hurt so badly? Right. And I realized I needed to fix myself and I hired mm -hmm. a relationship coach and worked through a lot of things. And she asked me, she's like, do you want that cheerleader partner? Or do you want a partner who's independent and driven and my response was, I, I I don't know if it exists, but I want both. Yes. Um, and it was such a fascinating thing. And obviously now I'm married and my my wife is that person. Uh, by the way, that's the first time on this podcast I referred to her as my wife. So that's oh. that's a big deal right there. Yes, um, it but, is. But what was that like to say to yourself, hey, I, I'm okay with taking a step back and supporting your husband in the way that you did? And and by the way, that's that's no easy feat in itself. Let me tell you, it's no easy feat for a lot of reasons. I mean, I grew up in a um, a dysfunctional home, like probably most of us, but, you know, alcoholic parents. And I watched how my mother was really kind of trapped. And when I say that, my dad was a really, really good man. He was a naval aviator. He was a, he was a really good man. But when he would drink, he wasn't such a great man, right? Mm. And so... But I watched the fact that my mother really had nowhere to go. She didn't have an outlet. And I always um, thought to myself, I never, ever want to put myself into a position with anyone where I can't leave, where I can't save myself. So that was kind of my big thing. That was like, you know, Miss Independent. I was the first one to go to college in my family, all these things. So for me to do this was, a. I mean, believe me, my friends are like, are you crazy? <laughs> but you know, um, it was, a, it was a leap of faith, but I really felt good about it. It wasn't something that I was pressured to do. It wasn't something that he was saying, you have to do this. I mean, it was really a mature, right? Cause it takes a lot of emotional maturity to get to that point. Uh, place to say, here's what I'm doing. Here's what you're doing. How are we going to make this work? 
So, you know, it wasn't an easy decision, but there were a couple things I want to tell you that John did do. And listen, in my book, if you read my book, you'll know it's not like after that we had the storybook uh, relationship. <laughs> Matter of fact, yeah. it was the book is not a book that says, oh, look at us. We have this great relationship and we're going to tell you how to do it. No, it's a book of we went through hell and we got out on the other side. But here's some tips and action steps that you can take to not have happen to us, to you, what happened to us. Um, but, you know, one of the things that John did, and I give him a lot of credit for this, is when I did decide to, uh, quote unquote, get behind him. And when I say that, you know, it, it actually freed me up, kind of do some of the things I wanted to do hmm. that I couldn't do when I needed, needed to pay my bills. Started taking acting classes. I was in a play, you know? So, you know, it wasn't like, oh, I was, you know, you know, being put down, I really had the freedom to kind of do some of the fun stuff I wanted to do without the pressure of having to make money, sure. but, you know, providing a home and a place for John to come home to and be a sounding board. But any one, one, anyway, one of the things he did was he never, ever, no matter what, in the face of a fight, in any struggles that we had ever said to me, you're not making money. Mm. what are you doing for the family? You know, before I started having kids or during the time that I, uh, you know, were, was raising our children, he always, always approached things and talked about things as our money, what we're doing together. And I got to tell you, that was a big one. And it wasn't something we thought about. It wasn't something we had agreed on. It was just the way he did it. And it, it's, so it's something for me to see now after the fact, you know, now we're celebrating 26 years of marriage. We've been together 28 where I look back and say, that was a big deal because if he had made me feel bad about that, things would be different. Right. I'd yeah. have been like, I'm out. I'm going, you know, I can make my own money. Yeah. Sure. So that was a big thing that he did. Yeah, actually, it's it's interesting because I, I believe, and this is may, might be an old statistic, but the number one reason for divorce is financial strain. Not necessarily financial like, oh, we can't pay our bills, but an argument over finances. So to have an open dialogue about that and to understand that we are together in so many ways when it comes to that, like, were, was John and yourself aware of that or was it just natural for him to be that way? Right. So I think it was just a natural thing in way that he was. Now, let me just get this clear. He never, ever made me feel bad for not earning money. But we had financial struggle. I mean, we were poor as church mice when, when, we, when we got married. And I, living with an entrepreneur, it was like, oh my gosh, we're making a lot of money. Oops, that company went out of business. We don't have any money. I mean, it was like an yeah. up and down. And so we definitely fought about money and about spending money. And I do, again, I he'd love that I'm saying this. He's gonna be like, oh my gosh, I'm finally getting credit. <laughs> but you know, I can remember uh, our kids were young and we had moved down here to this place called Ponte Vedra Beach. And you know, people had more money, right? So we were kind of in a different area. We were, were up and down, but you know, kind of this, the, the, the trajectory was getting a little higher, but, um, I had a lot of friends. My son was on this little baseball team and the moms were driving around in these Escalades and mm. Range Rovers. And they were buying these big, beautiful houses. And I would come home and I would be like, honey, you know, I want a new car. And he was like, no, we only pay for what we can afford. Like, you know, we can only pay for, we're not, we're not dating. And I got to tell you, I'm so grateful to him for that now. Mm -hmm. um, because not that I'm happy about this, but several people that we knew ended up like all of a sudden 2008 crash happened and they lost, they didn't have anything. And, you know, unfortunately some of the marriage, there's a whole, but you know, it was more about like, he was not going to spend beyond our means. But the beautiful thing about that was when we got to that place, 
then we, you know, all of a sudden kind of made these jumps. And so, you know, he was just, he's definitely um, smart about money like that, but it was definitely a huge stressor. So just know that, you know, it wasn't like, you know, we were flitting about, but you know, it was, it was small, smart decisions early on. And I trusted him in that. Yeah. You know, I didn't fight that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 2000, I was, I was only, I I think I was like 23 years old in 2008. (laughs) And I, and I, I lost my job at that point. I was already, you know, I lived alone since I was 18, but I lost my job, but I was renting and I, you know, I made do and fun fact, I ended up getting a job selling lawn service, like door to door. I got chased by dogs and chased away by people with guns. And and I ended up doing that for a couple of weeks and then got my job back. Like the company ended up re like resurging. So thank, thank goodness. I didn't do that for very long, but um, you know, you kind of make do, but I heard so many individuals that were, were credit card rich, right? Like it wasn't actually their money. They didn't own anything. It was all owned by the banks. And it is a scary moment to realize that we could be coming up on that again, right? Like that could be happening again in this country. And so I think just people hearing that from a standpoint of like a financial like tip, don't, don't, don't live beyond your means. Mm-hmm. Um, you and know, then enjoy it once you can have the 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 big house, the nice cars, the travel, the everything else in between. That's huge. But I want to ask you this. So why relationship grip? Why what made you want to open up about your relationship when you were opening this new chapter of, hey, I'm Catherine Gordon and I have something to say? Yeah, that's a good question. So what ended up happening was I, my kids both played sports. So growing up in this town, you know, and it, this is just the way it is. You normally end up getting friendly with the parents of the kids your your kids are playing sports with. And so sure. now fast forward, both my kids are gone, right? They're off to college at Clemson, but it was the strangest thing. I kept running into women that I had known through these relationships. And I swear it seemed to always happen like in the vegetable aisle near the carrots or something. Like they just stopped me and go, I'm leaving my husband or we're getting a divorce or, you know, I just kept hearing all these, these, you know, very sad um, things that were happening to couples, married couples in our community And so I would stand there in the, and at this time I had, obviously that's why I wrote it, right? You asked me that, but I mean, at this time I wasn't really working with relationships, but I would start to listen to what they were saying. And there were some common themes that started coming out of that. And some of them were really basic, Justin, like, um, they would share something with me about their, their not being happy about something or these struggles that were going on. I'd say, Did you talk to him about that? Like, have you guys had a conversation? What does he think? Oh, I haven't talked to him about that. I was so shocked to find that so many married couples and some of them that have been married for 25 years were not communicating. Like we're not communicating. And so the more I started to hear this and kind of share my own stories and you know, um, give a little bit of advice. I finally came home one day and I said, John, I really feel like I need to write this book because like I said, my, my book is not like, oh my gosh, you know, we had this amazing relationship all these years. And so I want you to know about it. No, I mean, we had infidelity, we had, you know, money struggles. I mean, there was health issues. There was a lot of things that happened. And so that's when I realized, I think I need to write a book and kind of have it as an action plan and tips to help couples have a great relationship and stay together, right? Stay together. Yeah. Um, I got to tell you, there's one common theme that I started to see also, and I'm, I'm contemplating how I'm going to put that out into the world, but Again, as I started hearing, hearing things after I wrote the book and now out speaking on the book and doing workshops on the book, there's something else that's come up and it represents, like I said, different, different in different ways. I hear it differently, but it's one thing. And that is that everybody wants to feel wanted. They Mm want to feel desired. And I know it's kind of like, well, yeah, yeah but you would be surprised. I mean, I was talking to a woman, I went on a ski trip, was talking to a woman, she'd been married 35 years, her and her husband were now living in separate homes, 
trying to figure things out. And as I'm talking to her and she's telling me her issues, I realize she doesn't, she's not desired. She doesn't feel wanted. So, you know, it could be like couples that just started dating. I mean, it just, it boiled down that we all want to feel wanted, relevant, desired, right? So anyway. And that's, that's so, that's so big and things that I've learned through my life. And obviously we all know the five love languages and understanding what your partner's is versus just your own. Like my, so it's crazy. So I take every, every time I've taken the test two or three times, words of affirmation overwhelmingly blows everything else out of the water. Tell me I'm great. Tell me I'm, I look great. Tell me all those things. That's good enough for me. Now, physical touch is very much on the bottom of my list, but physical touch is my wife's number one. And so I'm aware, like, that's how I show her that she's desired. That's how I show her she's wanted. That's how I show her I love her. And I'm just so keenly aware of that. Now, I've been married for three weeks. Like, I don't have the same issues as somebody who's been married for 20, 30, 40 years. But something that you mentioned pretty much in passing, but I want to kind of dive deeper if you're open to it. You mentioned you had infidelity in your relationship. Mm-hmm. For most people, probably including myself, I would go, that's it. I can't go further. Talk, if you're comfortable, talk a little bit more about that and kind of dive into how did you guys work through that? Totally comfortable talking about it because Justin, this is what you have to understand. Okay. So my nickname for John, when we started dating and, you know, even early on in our marriage, our sex was not good. I'm just going to tell you, our sex was not good. And yes, I'm going to say I had premarital sex. We were having sex when we moved in together after, after three months, two or three months, we did not have good sex. And even when we got married, it was not good. And I, I'm, it wasn't like I was promiscuous, but I was just definitely more sexually open, more sexually aware, more expansive. Let's say sure. that. Whereas John was always the prude, you know, just, he was, he was uptight and he was a prude. I mean, the, our running joke was that um, in his past life, he had been a Puritan that came over on the Mayflower. <laughs> I swear to Fair. God. Okay. I mean, I, and you know, even to this day, I call him vanilla. He's vanilla. I'm Neapolitan. But, but so you got to understand when I found this out and I didn't find it out until 14 years into our marriage. So he cheated on me when we first got married mm. and Um, it was a stressful time for us. No excuses. So when I tell you this, I'm, but I'm going to tell you the, the viewpoint, you know, it was a stressful time, um, um, financially, um, we weren't really connected and John back then was definitely more, uh, self-absorbed. He was very much about himself and, um, you know, it worked for us when we met because I am very independent. So I didn't really need to hang out with him all the time. I mean, I needed that physical, like I needed connection, but then, you know, we would go to a party and I would be out talking it because I'm an extrovert. And so I would just be all around the party talking to everybody. And then at the end of the night, we come back together and we leave. So that was kind of the way it was, but you know, so he, he ended up, um, He says, you know, and I don't, I want to make sure I speak right for him, that, you know, he was just not happy in his own life and he was looking for an easy way out. You know, we were having the stressors of two small children, money, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, it wasn't like a, for him, it was an emotional affair. It was more of just some kind of excitement that, you know, somebody was desiring him, Mm. showing him he was wanted, right? Because I was so busy and no blame because that should never happen. So let's, we'll talk about that, but you know, cause you're going to have some ebb and flow, but um, anyway, stupid decision on his part, but I'm going to part, I'm going to tell you about this. Cause this is, this is funny. And he does not like me to tell this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> so, oh my God, he's going to kill me. I wonder if I should tell you, but this is oh, how I God works. Tell I feel like it's a God thing. And I don't know if you believe in God, but I do. It's he's manifested many different things in my life, but so we moved down to Atlanta, I mean, uh, to uh, Jacksonville here from Atlanta. And my husband, we'd had a couple bars in Atlanta. He was 24 years old when I met him, very young. I was 28. And um, 
had opened these bars with some friends, but then started seeing some of his other friends getting into this dot com thing. So he ended mm. up signing up with a, a dot com company. And so I wanted to move to the beach. I had lived on the ocean, not on the ocean, but at the ocean my whole life, always had been to the ocean. So when I had my kids, I really wanted to get back there. So long story there, but we ended up in, in, in Ponte Vedra Beach. So the dot-com company that I was working for went bust. So here we were down in, down in Ponte Vedra with a house payment that, you know, we, we needed to make, you know, we had a couple maybe a month of, of back money to be able to pay our bills. And so the, one of the investors of this company, any device was Martin Sprock who owned planet smoothie and Moe's Southwest grill. So, so he's doing all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, he wanted John to open Moe's. He kept saying it. So we ended up opening or signing up to open 10 Moe's down here. So there's a whole story behind that, but it so it was the real estate agent that he uh, was using, she was like 45, 50. I mean, the whole story, but he says he went to her house to, you know, oh my God, he's going to kill me for saying this story. But, but it, it goes to her house, you know, she goes back in the room, takes her clothes off, comes out. Oh, he said he comes in and there's her dog had pooped all over the house. Oh that, was like the, that was like the first thing. And that she goes back in her room and comes out with no clothes on. And he goes, all of a sudden, something just hit me. And he's like, she's not my wife. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So he like leaves, doesn't talk to the woman again. So anyway, that's kind of what happened. Like his whole thing is I did not actually have sex with anybody. But to me, that doesn't matter because, you know, infidelity is infidelity. And there were a couple other things there. I don't need to go into them. But I just thought it was funny because it was such a God thing. Like, you mm -hmm. know, the veil was lifted. And so here was the situation. But my point with all this is 14 years later, we're walking on the beach. Well, it was 12 years later from that time. I should say we're walking on the beach. I'm not feeling connected in our relationship. He at this time is a different man. I got to give him that. Like he has worked really hard. He, he's a different man. He's, 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 he's now a Christian. He was Jewish. There's a whole story behind that. And he proceeds to tell me this story thinking, I'm not going to get that mad about it. And I was just like, what? So it threw me into a whole, uh, like a midlife crisis. Like I was going to cheat on him because like I said mm. to you, I was the one that was always so like sexually open to even hear that this happened was like, what you did what? And so I tried to cheat on him. I tried, you know, so there's a lot of, of stuff that went into that. I, it didn't end up happening again. Somehow I, somehow I didn't end up being able to cheat on him. I wanted to, like, I wanted to hurt him. <laughs> yeah, oh, I get it. I yeah, was, that's crazy. Yeah. And so to get back to your question, that was kind of like a whole pit stop over there. No, it's an but, important pit stop. Yeah. I didn't quite give all the details because I realized John Gordon might kill me, but uh, I could tell you off camera. So, so anyway, but to answer your question, how do you navigate that? Yeah. That's a good question because before that time, I would have told you if anybody ever did that to me, I was out of there. And, um, it's funny how things work because what I realized is I really loved him and it hurt. It hurt a lot. And I tried to cheat on him and I tried to leave him and I tried, you know, all these things, but ultimately, and by the way, I got to say something that he did. He did a couple things that, um, that I, that really kept me in the relationship too. If he had, after he can, you know, gave me his confessions, if he had, kind of been what's the word I want to want to say like an ass about it to be honest like sure. after that I wanted to see his phone at the drop of a hat after that I I would you know I wanted to ask him tell me again what happened because there were other things tell me again um if he had said like listen I'm sick of talking about this or I don't want to talk you know if he had in any way been like that I don't think we'd be together Sure. But you know what? He wasn't. He like stayed and no matter what I asked, no matter what 
questions. And I mean, I would drill him. Trust me. I wanted to like get down to the nitty gritty. Like what was she wear? Like I wanted everything. What did you do? What'd you touch? Why and was there he dog just, poop everywhere? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the last time they got together, by the way. So there were like a couple, I just had to share that because I yeah, just, just a crazy story. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, it was hard to navigate, but what was great is that he never, ever gave up on keeping us together. And that is a part of the acronym in my book. The grit is an acronym, right? So one of the things that he did was in the midst of all this, and believe me, I'm trying to leave him. I'm trying to cheat on him. You know, he ends up meeting this guy on a plane, pours his heart out, telling him everything that he had, you know, that it's happened and his wife's going to leave him. And the guy said, same thing, something very similar happened to me in my marriage. Come up with a prayer, come up with a prayer that you guys say together. And believe me, you got to understand when he initially come up with this prayer, I'm like rolling my eyes like, oh, right. buddy, no, like this is not going to save you. But it's weird. He would say this prayer every single night, every he'd be up traveling, he would call. And so between that, which is the G and God bringing God into your relationship. And when I say God, I know like some people might have a problem with God, but if you think about it, even 12 step programs, you know, have a higher power. So it's something 100%. bigger than yourself. So bringing God or a higher power into your relationship. And the other part of that is the R, which is resolve. So he had resolved that he was going to fight for me, that he was not the same person he used to be, and he was going to fight for our relationship. And that's what happened. Yeah. yeah. So we so, can go through the IT, but you might have some other questions. And we yeah. So how, how long was this process for you? Right. Yeah. Like, I think, I think a lot of times what happens in relationships and let me know if you got to this point at some, at some point, like when we realize, okay, like there's something not right in this relationship, we point fingers a lot, right? Like, oh, it's because I didn't get attention from my spouse or I didn't do this or I didn't do that. Clearly there was something stopping you from cheating. There was something stopping you from uh, leaving him in some way, shape or form, but how long was this process? And then you got to the point where like, okay, now we're going to work on this together. Yeah. Um. So I want to say, I mean, it was a good, I kind of went wild. So it was like a good uh, four months of me really kind of him just continuing to try and continue to try. And he would leave notes all over the house all the time. Um, I think probably by that third or fourth month, and I, I say this, I talk about this, but you know, as he's been saying this prayer one night for whatever reason, and I had started to memorize the prayer just because he said it all the time and I knew sure. it. And sometimes I kind of say it in my head, but I've never given the satisfaction of actually saying it out loud. One night I was laying in bed and I, I, I almost, it's almost like I just felt something in my heart and I started to say the prayer with him. And so it was then, it was that night that I, I knew I wanted to stay with him and I knew that I wanted to work on this, you know, so that period of me going through my midlife crisis after, uh, by the way, during that time, so he drops the bomb, I'm, you know, totally freaking out. I end up, I was at the gym and, and there was a therapist there that I knew Deb Hardman. And I was like, Deb, you're not going to believe what happened. I tell her the story and you know what she says to me? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you're not getting any, you're not getting any more pretty. I mean, every day is the prettiest. It was something like that. Oh my God. Which like, I mean, that like completely drew me to like a midnight. I was like, oh my God. I'm like, okay, what's, I still look back and I go, what was that? What was the meaning of that? Like, what was the purpose? I don't know. But um, so, so after that, and after I made the decision, it wasn't like, okay, I made the decision and it's all over where, you know, it's in the, in the, in the, um, you know, water under the bridge. Then it became us really working on our relationship together. And for us, Justin, 
it was a, about a spiritual component, about like praying together, communicating. So we call it the four C's. So it's communicating because where there's a void in communication, negativity will fill it. Yeah. Right. So it's connecting and you have to communicate to connect. So make sure that you're connecting. And for us, it, we ended up starting to take walks, like regular walks together, um, even or just sitting out on the back, you know, but not that we have to hang out together all the time, but and making sure we make that committed time together, which is the next C, which is commit, committing to each other. And I know that sounds obvious, but again, you'd be surprised in relationships, yeah. you can get complacent, 100%. right? And then yeah. the last C is care, showing that you care, like, you know, making the effort, showing them that they're important, maybe showing them that they're wanted, right? That might even fall under the, the care, the C. So the four C's, and we kind of use that throughout um, to work on our relationship and, you know, strengthen it. And I have to say, now we definitely have a very strong relationship. And I say that in that it was a long road. And I say it because you don't have to go through any of the things that we went through to get there. Yeah. And that's, yeah. and that's powerful to be, I, I love the idea of learning from others mistakes, right? Like this podcast over the last seven years has been my greatest teacher just hearing stories and being able to pick brains of people who've been through so much to go, okay, well, I don't want to go down that road. How do I make sure I don't, right? How do I fix it before it's even a problem? Uh, and that's that's so key. And I'm so glad you're sharing it. But I want to get into the I and T yep. of grit so people understand this framework so they can then go grab the book. Okay. So I said the G was God or a spiritual, you know, higher power. Our resolve resolve to work on your marriage. What I say about R is the grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. So make sure you're doing that, which falls into the I, which is invest. Mm -hmm. And um, again, as I just talked about, kind of collides with the four C's and that, you know, when you get married, especially and life happens, you're super, super busy and you're working on your craft and they're working on their craft and you've got kids and, you know, all these things. Sometimes you can, you're the last two to, to look at each other or connect with each other, but it's kind of like, this is what I, I liken it to like, you want to be fit and healthy, right? Well, you have to work on it. You have to invest. You have to yeah. go to the gym. You have to work out right? You have to eat the right foods. So same with your relationship. You've got to make sure that you're investing in the relationship and not being a consumer. Don't always be the one that's take, 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 or expecting. Make sure you're giving. And then the next letter is T, which is together. And, um, you know, it's not always going to be equal. It's not always like, okay, you're going to get 50% and, you know, or I'm a hundred, you're a hundred. There's going to be an ebb and flow. I don't believe in work life balance, by the way there. I don't, you yeah, know, doesn't think, you exist. know, especially yeah. in the way that my husband and I raised our kids. I mean, it was, you know, there was no balance. It was about, okay, here's where we're going to carve out time for here. Here's where we're going to, and it's the same in your relationship, but you both have to want it. And sometimes I say that the T can also stand for team. Make sure you remember that you're on the same team and you're not on opposing teams. Mm. And you can get into that a lot, right? I mean, I've seen yeah. couples where one of them starts losing weight and looking good and the other one doesn't encourage them. Why? Because they feel insecure and they don't feel feel good in the relationship. That's one of the main reasons. But so then they're jealous. They don't like it. No, it's like the more you start to encourage each other and lift each other up, the higher you guys go together. So make sure you're doing it together. Yeah. I love, I love all of that stuff. So I think it's important for people to understand, like, who did you write this book for? I understand you were meeting the women in the grocery store by the carrots and they're saying, I'm getting a divorce. But when does this book need to be read by people that are in relationships? 
Justin, what I've found is this book needs to be read for couples that have not gotten married yet or are thinking about it. And then a really cool story is I got an email from an 82 year old woman. And she told me that she read my book with her husband, Jerry, who was 90. Wow. And that after that, they started saying the prayer together. And it was so cute because there's a little part in, in the email where she says, um, she says, and I almost went to yell at Jerry, but then, you know, I, 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 I remembered and I did something different, you know, so just something in my book helped this. And that was like my best. I mean, I get, I get a lot of emails actually and, and messages about how it saved uh, marriages and it's done. It definitely has saved a lot of marriages and I'm grateful to God for that. But it, when, you, when you hear like that, an 82 year old woman and a 90 year old man, they've been married. I think she said 65 or 67 years can actually use some of the tips in my book. I'm like, wow, that's no, it. I love, so really, I, I love it. Yeah. I, I can't wait to dive in being a newlywed and, and being able to take those tools into our relationship because look, I'd rather build a strong ship than continuously plug holes, right? Like make sure you're on a solid foundation in some way, shape or form. Uh, in order to take that relationship to the next level. And like you said, continue to rise together. Uh, and I think that's the cool part about my marriage now is like, that's how we view what we're doing. Like everything we're doing is to be together and to rise together and to build a life that we truly want. Um, and that's constant support of one another. And that's that's just so huge. But I want to ask you a question that I ask every single person on the show. It's a two-part question. Okay. So the first part is, what is your definition of success? And the second part is, what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? To, to enjoy the success of? To ensure the success of yourself. So th whatever your definition is, and then three things you do every day to make sure oh, that happens. Okay. So my definition of success is um, having the freedom to, to do what I want to do every day, not being beholden to any people, place, or thing, being able to provide my family with the encouragement, love, support, both emotionally and financially to help them be successful. I'm giving you three. Oh no, I'm three. supposed to give you three, three things I do every day. Yeah. Three things so, you do every day. Okay. So one of the things I do is I pray. So I get up in the morning and I say a prayer and, um, I just ask for God to let me be a vessel to help others and, um, kind of take it from there. I exercise because that's important to feeling healthy and being healthy and being able to go do all those fun things that I want to do. And what's the third thing? So the problem with me is I'm not consistent, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. So the third thing for success. I'll remember after I, I'll remember something after we're done. Um, so I always work out. I mean, I eat healthy most of the time. Yeah, that's important. That's important. Yeah. And so, so most people have their three or, you know, similar to that. And I've had a few people go, I don't do three things every single day. Like, I'm just not that person. And that's okay, too. And we realize that, you know, the life that we create for ourselves and the habits that we put into place is is all to the benefit of being happy, right? Like, that's really the end of the day. That's what we're all chasing. We think it's the money, we think it's the external things. But it's really like, how do we create our own happiness, our own joy, our own fulfillment every single day. So I love hearing that from you. Uh, yeah. And so I wrap up every single interview with the same question, but before we get there, let's get to the important stuff. How do people get a hold of you? Where do they follow you? How do they get the book? All that stuff. Yeah. So um, you can find me at my website, katherineforreal.com. Um, I'm on Instagram at Catherine Gordon and on Facebook, the same. What was the next question you asked me? Uh, where do they get the book? Oh, Yes about that. You can get the book on any major bookseller, but I highly recommend, this is great, Justin, for you too. Um, when you get the book, 
all you do, you can, I have a free action plan that I'm telling you really should needs, it needs to be a course. Like I just don't have time, but really I need to take it all and put it into a course, but it's a free action plan that literally can set you up for success. So, you know, you talked about doing the things to, to strengthen your relationship. I always say there's a saying, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't coin this, but when you strengthen the root and nurture the root, you get the fruit, mm. right? And so when you can start to build on that, this action plan, I'm telling you, it's, it'll it'll blow you away. So when you buy the book, you just enter the code and you go to relationshipgritbook.com and you can get the free action plan. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Highly recommend everybody go out and get it. I've seen her talk. I've had this great conversation. I'm gonna read the book. I'm gonna get the action plan. So everybody else do the same thing. And like I said, I wrap up every single interview with the same question. Since the show is called the Growth Now Movement, that question is, in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Well, so uh, we didn't talk about this, but I, you know, grew up pretty wild and I did a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking. It was, there was a lot. And so I ended up not... You know, I quit drinking when I was 25, met my husband like that. And then through the years, I've drank some and I've not drank some. And so I ended up starting to drink again. I never did drugs again, by the way, after that time in my 20s. But um, but I ended up drinking again. And just this New Year's Eve, I had a great bender. <laughs> it was amazing. Too much so. And I decided I'm not drinking. So it's been great though, because, you know, as you get older, especially you just, the hangovers are not, you just, it's hard. And so I'm just kind of enjoying life again from a different place. I love champagne. I love, you know, I love fruity drinks. I just love that, but it just started not loving me. And so um, I'm not drinking. I'm, 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 and it make it just, by default makes me healthier. I love it. So, yeah. I mean, it. if the, if the, if the drinks aren't loving you, you got to love yourself. And, uh, so that's, that's an important message for so many people for sure. But yeah. Catherine, this yeah. conversation, you know has, what, sorry, not drinking now at days, it's gotten really cool. That's the other thing too. Right. That is true. They have like all these like mocktail bars now. And like you go and you don't get drunk, you just drink the mocktails. And, uh, and actually Dr. Rewire has like a non-alcoholic drink that he was telling me about. I don't know the details, uh, but it's like a non-alcoholic drink that you feel the buzz and with no hangover, no bad whatevers. Uh, so you have I to reach out to him and that ask is. him. Cause yeah, yeah. There's it's some like a herbs. keto thing. Okay. There's some herbs out there. There's a drinkable herb. Honestly, for me, once I, cause I'm such an extrovert, once I start just talking to people and I, I get high, any, I get high off you. I get high off life. So it doesn't, it. you know, re I really don't need it, but I know a lot of people do. So it's a good, good thing, but yeah. Yeah. So then ignore what I just said about what Dr. Rewire was saying. Oh, I'm so, I, I'm, I need to ask him. I'm going to ask him about it though. I'm always, I mean, it always piques my interest. No, for sure. But here's my thing. If I'm going to get high, I'm going to get high. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is what I'm about. You see? So there's no imitation. I'm rather doing it or I'm not. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. Dude, Catherine, this conversation has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. We'll have to have you come on when the when the new books come out. We'll dive into those topics. But this was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Thank you, Justin.